welcome everybody. Uh, get started now and other people will shift in or fall asleep or whichever. It's tough for you and tough for me after lunch, but we'll try to make the best of it. My name is Josh Lieberman and uh, I'm a senior manager at Deloitte and I'm in the analytics practice, which tries to help clients make decisions with numbers. Um, hopefully they're good decisions and made from good numbers and so that's some of the factors that I work with. My specialty is geospatial analytics. I really work on developing new methods to use location and place, to use uh, spatial representations and relationships to make better decisions as well. And so uh, the topic of this summit has largely been mobile and government and what I'm trying to do here for a few minutes is to stick another term in there. And I'm going to use the term GIS to start with, uh, but I'm going to try to go beyond that. So we're going to try to take a little journey in and out of the G uh, in government. So we're going to look at using both location-based data and mobile services, mobile apps, uh, and generally a mobile perspective. And what does that mean? in order to change the way government works. So, in fact, we're going to talk about how government is already changing it, and hopefully we can run around to the front of it. So, here's some of the pieces of the puzzle that I want to talk about. You know, what, what's involved? You know, what are people already doing that you can already download an app for? I went to the Apple App Store and, you know, there are a thousand apps that say government in there somewhere. Some of them are produced by various governments. Many of them are not, but they're using public data. Um, they're making use of government services to provide you a service. And that's actually one of the most exciting parts is the way that you can cross those boundaries and provide more effective use. So I want to talk a little bit because I want to advocate for the value of geospatial and geospatial analysis in making those apps, making that interaction with and by government work. Um, so it helps to have a common understanding. Um, and I do want to try to put that in some sort of historical or evolutionary perspective. Uh, that's when we go back and look over the chaos that's um, occurred and, and make sense of it. Uh, in retrospect, uh, in order to understand how GIS and the mobile use of GIS uh, can benefit government, is benefiting government, it helps to understand, to come to agreement about what we think government properly is involved in, uh, because those are all possibilities for using this sort of technology and approach. Um, then we have the data, we have the technology, but especially for mobile use of spatial information, it's really important how that interaction takes part. What's the, the paradigm for people being citizens on the go? And uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, sometimes you don't even have to do anything. And that's a great opportunity. And it's kind of a scary one. So there's this term you've probably heard of digital exhaust is that your devices, the many things you do during the day, all put across information about what you're doing and where you're doing it. And that can be leveraged analytically to produce all sorts of useful information and to help you. But they also may say things about you that you don't necessarily want to be known. So talk a little bit about that. And then a little bit of what's next. Uh, what do we see coming on the horizon as far as how we're using mobility and place to be, to be better citizens and to be better served as citizens. So, a day in the mobile life. Uh, you know this, because I'm sure you do this as well. Uh, our phones, our mobile devices, but particularly our phones, are becoming really integral, essential parts of our lives. Um, we used to have a thermometer outside the window and it broke and I keep meaning to get another one but it's just so easy to look on the phone in the morning and say oh yeah that's the forecast um, 
for this area. And uh, it just keeps going with, you know, well, people start hitting me with email while I'm walking the dog. I try to hold the bag in one hand and the phone in the other. And uh, I don't use the phone in the car if I can avoid it, but there is finding where to go, finding where the traffic is, finding what uh, the conditions of the news are before you set off on your commute. So there are ways in which we interact with information on our phones which are way beyond what we do with the PC and certainly beyond our normal, apparently, our normal interaction with government. You know, there are uh, now a ton of ways that, you know, this is the government we're working with, one government or another, but they're all parts of our daily life. You know, when's the next bus? Well, there's 15 apps that people have coded, but it's all using that data from the transit system. You know, closest public toilet, well, um, sometimes that's actually been collected. Other times, those toilets have been constructed, but the crowd, people with an interest, uh, have gone and recorded those locations. Uh, sometimes they've recorded a lot more stuff. Uh, for example, an open street map. And they've made it possible to access a lot of information that sometimes we're a little uneasy about. You know, okay, um, I want to know if there are any sex offenders around this new park that I'm interested in taking my kids to. Do I know that it's fair to every one of the people that may be on that list that there are no errors? Not sure, but it's one of those bargains that we are every day now making the exchange of privacy and personal rights for the opportunities of access to information. So that's a lot of it, and it's made more acute by the problem that when you know the where, then you may know a lot more. Probably some of you have heard about the fact that although your phone is tracking your location and providing that anonymously, uh, nearly the pattern of your life and where you go uh, has a very good chance of identifying exactly who you are, although your name is not um, in that track. So keep in mind that we are balancing a lot of um, different values here and asking, you know, what is worth that balance, what isn't, um, but is there anything and what can we do about that? So um, I wanted to look at some of these um, applications because they're just so many of them. This is just a few of the ones that I picked up um, looking around. And, um, you know, here is uh, one that is a web app, but it's not a mobile app. I can put in my address, but I can't yet go around and say, you know, what's the mobile broadband situation here? Yet, this is incredibly important information from the other perspective, which is that all of this, you know, fair access to this information relies on having this internet access. Um, it's sometimes easy to forget the infrastructure that is involved in making all of this a low entry energy, uh, easy to do, easy to innovate, easy to try things with. And so that's a really important part of this. Uh, I worked with, some of you may um, know Mike Byrne, who was uh, GIO in California and now is GIO of the FCC. And this is FCC work, taking 56 states and territories of broadband access data and we helped him munge it all together in a way that could be used to provide this information. The other thing about this is that it's not raw information. So at this particular point, we're showing you information, right? But we can step back and look at maps that analyze that information, look at different metrics of broadband speed, quality, accessibility, and so on. And so, an important part of this is not only providing info here and now, but providing analysis, providing means to make decisions here and now. So um, let's look at something 
this is a system that we built uh, for the city of San Antonio, and it's a way of finding out where the uh, managing the whole process actually of um, street cut permits. So street cuts and street condition and potholes. Um, if you had to take a survey, you'd say there are more apps for dealing with potholes than with anything else. I think that's probably the case. And uh, so this was originally, you know, a paper-based system, and then it was computerized, but it was screens in particular locations. And uh, so there was a lot of lack of transparency to this process. You have multiple stakeholders, most of whom <clears throat> do business by telephone call. And uh, so this became web-based, and most importantly, a means for the different participants to have their roles defined. So it's not a mobile app yet. Yet, people use this um, on a mobile basis. They go to where it is that they need to do some work, um, define where that is, and uh, submit a permit application. And the inspectors go periodically during the course of that work and take pictures and present reports. You know, okay, they reported they filled it in. Did they fill it in? What's the condition of the road? And uh, people can also report, you know, <clears throat> I just went by there and there's a, there's a big pile of mud there and they didn't really clean that up. So their interesting stage in the evolution of this sort of mobile participation, they're all the roles that people can and want to do on a mobile basis, but they're not quite there yet. Now, there are other, uh, let's see, where we are here other means of doing this. So here's one of these submit a pothole and, um, places, add the photo, you know, the location, the description, you can put your name in or not. And uh, so some people are willing to do that, other people are not willing to stop. Other people look at uh, social media and say, well, okay, where are there tweets having to do with these areas? Um, so, but somebody still has to be sitting in their car, you know, I just went over this pothole. Uh, so that's not so good either. Um, so one is that social interaction and gathering that information. The other, is, you know, can be done on the go, but there are other things that you can do. And people have been developing a, an app uh, in Boston, and this is just a simulation of that, you know, what you do notice when you go over the pothole is that you go over the pothole. And uh, so what you can do is to have an app that does this. If you get enough of those going like that, then that tells you there is some disturbance in the force in that part of the street. And uh, so that's, so this is some of this intentional digital exhaust. You know, you can run the app, you can say, I wanna help out, but you know, I don't wanna mess with my phone in the car. And uh, I don't want to stop and take pictures, you know, I'm in a hurry. So, um, so this is an interesting step in the evolution of how we insensibly, automatically, or, you know, in a, in a sense, sense of opting in to uh, participate via mobile GIS. So let's see if we can go back here. So these are some of the things that are possible, but what do we need to do? them. So the geospatial technology that we work with has, I would say, three pieces. And the first, always the first piece is the data. The second piece is what you can do with the data. So there, there is actual science involved. Um, and the third piece is how do you make that available? How do you make the data and the science available for the uses for which it's suited. So the most important thing about the data is that it's a model. We're taking reality and we're representing it in geometry. So when we say uh, this point is Sacramento, we don't really mean that Sacramento is a point. And uh, if you go to a restaurant at the point that represents Boston, 
you're going to be disappointed because it's in the middle of the CSX railroad yards. So the first thing is at different scales and for different purposes, we're representing reality um, using data. However, what we can do with that representation is to apply mathematics to its combination. So there are many ways that we can then work with those numbers. Uh, the principal way in GIS is you look at things that are spatially related. You say, well, if they're closer, they're more related than if they're farther away. And we can look at how farther away, in different ways. For example, the drive time map that shows us how far it is to get from places to uh, an area that we're analyzing. Uh, another uh, form of information is the picture, or raster, uh, imagery, uh, data where we have some observation in every point of that picture. Uh, it's your brain, or my brain, that says, well, wait a minute, I know what that picture is. But the numbers just say, in this box, there's a value. Uh, and some of this is very simple. Some of this is people walking around and making marks on that. Sometimes it is rocket science. So a lot of our ability to collect large amounts of information come from the sensor technology, such as satellites, that we have now. Uh, so there are many ways that we can get this. Uh, a lot of the ways that we're geo-enabling information now is to start with addresses and to be able to geocode them. So having, now this is infrastructure data, where the streets are, where the numbers on the streets, so that we can take an address and convert it into an absolute position on Earth that we can work with. Uh, sometimes we don't have anything as clear as an address, but the technology is improving to take text, pull out place names, decide by context what that place name refers to, and get a location that way. And then increasingly, we have GPS units everywhere which give us a direct indication. And our challenge is not those coordinates, but to understand what those coordinates mean. Uh, in terms of the other information that's connected to that. But that availability of technology means that we also have, a, I would say, a great democratization of sources of geospatial data. Uh, when you know, one big company says, well, I don't know what you're talking about, and somebody else says, well, I took a digital camera, I hung it off of a balloon, and here's a geo-referenced picture of that beach with the tar on it, uh, you know that the possibilities have just expanded. So my interest uh, is usually in how we can make use of that data better, because it drives both the applications that we can use, the other information that we can connect to it, and the motivation to get that basic data right in the first place. And uh, so when we're talking about mobile GIS apps, they're usually doing one of these functions and providing it to you visually. Not always. Sometimes it just, you know, here's a report of information related to your location. But uh, very often visual, uh, visualization is involved. So, you know, find a feature. Uh, a lot of the work is there's a lot of data. Organize it on a map or just show me what's closest to my point. And it gets down to many other things. And for the most part, they rely on this basic principle that if you're, the information that's close to you uh, or close to what you're interested in is going to have a stronger correlation than farther away. And so a lot of the analytical technique that lets us tell you about your neighborhood, your city, your context spatially is involved with that. And there's this mythical figure of 80%, um, which I think is crap. I think everything is spatial, but that's my prejudice. So where can you use geodata? So there is this traditional GIS of people who are expert analysts and munge this data and come up with very clever, and I mean that sincerely, cartographic representations of the results of that and produce this map uh, that's a very uh, honorable profession. 
Um, and the only problem is that it leaves a lot on the table these days in terms of providing information when and where it's needed. Now we have many ways these days of incorporating this information with others using the web. And, um, and that's great, dashboards and decision support, all of the BI tools, SAP will tell you, yeah, yeah, we can put those points on a map. But it's still, it's not really reaching out there. And uh, so it's, it's the mobile apps that are really kind of the frontier right now uh, for two reasons. One is providing somebody at the point and location of a decision. But the other is that it provides a discipline for focusing a lot of data and a lot of computing power, which can be somewhere, into the point right here. And that's the paradigm that really makes the data have its full potential, both providing information out to people and pulling information back in. So I want to look at this a bit in the context of government. And one of the ways that these sorts of technologies have been characterized has been in terms of different kinds of government. So I'll call those stages of adaptation. So one of the first has been this evolution of government information and services to be online and to be digital. So I think of three things that were really happening there. One was turning information into digital information so that it could be reused with much, much less effort and expense than before. Uh, the other is that that information is now online. And the third is that you can make use of links, that you have a possibility of using the web so that instead of saying, well, you know, here's some information, but the rest of the information is at the BLM. There's a link that says, go see the other information about this lake at the BLM. Go see the other information about this lake at the EPA. So the, it's an amazing thing. You really can have on a browser screen federalism uh, operational. So, so that was sort of one stage. There's another stage, which is I'll call GGO. And uh, so this is overlapped, but was a bit separate, which was really to produce maps and then to make that process more and more electronic. So it's being able to use GIS by having boundaries, by having uh, areas, having such a thing as the soil maps, having such things as land use, land cover, the national map, the county maps, the state GIS information. That has gone through a couple of other stages, however. So one of the stages was to say, well, that's great to have that information here, but we have all this other information that's not tied to it. How do we tie it to that? OK, we've got information on state assets, but our locations are lousy. Why can't we connect those to accurate locations? So that's the geospatial enablement. But then there's, OK, so where does it matter? How does somebody? search for that, look at that um, in terms of where they are. So making that information searchable, that's another stage. And the stage that we're still in is, this is great, and we can't even imagine how this can be used. The responsibility uh, of government and also of organizations with a public interest is to build what's called spatial data infrastructure, to say, you know, this. This is an asset which takes investment, takes effort, has um, standards for quality and completeness and currency, just like a building. And uh, you know, it's gonna, we're going to put this road in made of data. And we don't know who's going to drive along it. But we know that something good will come out of it. So now comes along this other piece mobile government. And it's connected to both of those. Obviously, mobile government is a lot easier when the information is digital, when it can be on the web, when it can involve location, 
so that you have information pertinent to where you are while you're being mobile. But it has some other things to it. It has this necessity of working with a narrow pipe. Say, OK, I only can deal with this much information. You know, I don't care how much analysis it took. I just want this one piece of information. You know, our property value is going to go up or down next year, right here. Uh, it also, because it's that focus, tends to need to be conversational. You know, I can only ask one question at a time. Then I'm going to ask another question. Then I'm going to ask another question. And, uh, and it's multi-channel. You know, I have some information on the PC at home. I have some on my phone. I have some on the tablet. I go to the library. I don't want those all disconnected. I want to have those part of the same conversation I'm having with my government and my government with me. So that's another really interesting um, set of interactions. Now, you put those together, and so I'm going to call this something new. I'm going to call this PGov. And uh, I couldn't uh, decide which of the P's I meant, so I've included all of them. But uh, there's something about being able to do all three of these things together effectively that makes government, well, personal. You know, you saw picking up my phone every day and interacting with the government. You know, it's amazing. Uh, and I'm participating. You know, I'm reporting potholes. I'm asking, you know, how's it doing? You know, what's the uh, school budget? I don't think that, uh, you know, this much money should go into that area. Um, it allows me to partner. Say, well, you know, I know that you're having trouble keeping the location of parks um, or trees separate, but, you know, I'm going to go around on the weekend with my GPS and, and participate. I'm going to partner here. And the other thing, finally, is that it, it starts to beg the question, you know, well, what is the government for anyways? You know, when do you think of interacting with the government? And it really, I think, starts to become the government is the representative of the place. And so you interact with the government not because Necessarily, that's where I pay my property taxes, but because I interact with the government that's responsible for the places that I'm in or I'm interested in. So, so that's an interesting transformation that I want to explore some more. So that sort of leads to this, you know, what does this relationship look like going forward? And uh, that's what government can do for me, what can do for the government. And uh, so that raises the question, what are the things that government does? So I've, I've tried to boil it down a little bit. Um, and this, you know, in some sectors will be hopelessly naive. But I've picked out things that either currently people interact with in mobile, using mobile technology, or it certainly seems to me that they can and should. So uh, governments are involved with infrastructure. There's public infrastructure that it just makes sense that everybody uh, have access to. And this includes the spatial data and other kinds of data information and technology infrastructure. There is services. Now, you know, there I think is a lot more in play as far as who provides what services or what part of services, but certainly information services standard setting, playing field type services, and then health human services are generally the domains of uh, government activity. There's, there's territorial and uh, the security, commerce and migration, and also external relations. And in a federal system, of course, that's not only with uh, a foreign country, but you know the state with the uh, national government, the county with the state, the town with the county, and so on. So there's civil uh, education, justice, and community, the general work that governmental entities do to encourage and nurture and uh, invest in community. And then there's this part of a good government should have some um, mandatory, both have a mandate and provide a mandate for the activity in its purview. Now, 
this gets interesting in terms of the mobile technology we make use of because it involves these really overlapping domains. And so I'll just put these up here that there's the public, there's the communal, the personal, the social, the commercial, uh, and they overlap in all of these areas. So there is uh, always the question of, so what of this is governmental and what of this, you know, is best or increasingly handled in other ways because of money or because we have the technology. So, for example, streets in this country. The first digital representation of this was really what the Census Bureau had to do in order to walk around and ask you questions about who you are. And uh, that's called the Tiger Data Set. That was taken by a number of commercial companies. You know, this was totally unintentional, right? And built a you know many many billion dollar industry based on versions of that street data. Well, there used to be a number of street companies. There's only two now because it's a very expensive undertaking to keep that sort of data asset up to date. But it turns out that if you have enough millions of people willing to help out with their smartphones and their GPS, then you can do a pretty good job and you can come up with open street map. So there's still Tiger, there's still Navtech, and there's OpenStreetMap. So, you know, which is the proper one? Or are they all valuable? So lots of overlap. No right answers, but lots of room for innovation. So let's look at how people might engage in those roles and interactions of government and how this might be evolving over time. So there are a number of different ways that this goes on. So sort of the first one is, well, I want information, and I want information where I am or where I'm interested in. I typed in an address. You know, I said, use my location. And I just got information. It wasn't specifically for me, but it was information. Uh, the second step is really to ask, well, what are you really interested in? And this is where the analytics come in. Say, well, yes, I'm here, but what I'm really interested in is what's going on that I could walk within five minutes to? Or what threats are there within a five-minute drive? Or, you know, in this neighborhood, what's, what sort of income level, what sort of interests, lifestyles are here? And so those are all this, I not only have a specific location, I have a specific question, and I want somebody to do the work or something to do that. Uh, then there, we start to get more interactive. You know, Not only am I interested in the spot, but I want to provide information back. I've got a problem, I want government to do something for me. Uh, not only that, but I want to be part of the solution. Uh, you know, here's a pothole, and I'm mapping some other things around it, or I'm providing a sense of priority of which ones I think should be fixed first. And I think this ultimately, at a level of combining many of these technologies that we have access to, so the location, the mobility, and the social means of interacting with each other and with the government as part of that community, we have really uh, the means of organizing technology around dialogues having to do with place. I'm here, who else is here, what's going on here, what needs to be done here, and uh, so that sense that you can do that, and not only do that, but do that in real time. You know, this, this whole idea of, well, who else is bothered by this pothole? You know, how much were you bothered by it? What should we recommend? Uh, that's a sort of, sort of trivial example, but a way of looking at this. So, so these are some of the paradigms that we can enable with technology to implement to realize some of these interactions with government that we've gone through. And so a next step that I want to take is to ask, how is this going to change things? I always love this. Um, 
new way of looking at geography. So let's try to go up a little more. What do I mean by this PGov? Well, there is this personal part, um, this sense that the government is there for you personally, that services are there for you personally, and you're not having to go wait online for an hour or stay on hold on the phone for an hour like I just did with the estimable Massachusetts uh, registered motor vehicle. Uh, I get information when and where I need it. Not only that, but I can get a response on the spot. You know, what's the status of this project? You know, what are you planning to put in here? Uh, and we've all come to the point, and it is a striking contrast with other interactions with government, that I wake up at 3 in the morning and I can't sleep, and I can go find out all these things that my government is or shouldn't be doing, uh, what other people are doing according to the information they have. We just now assume that this is always available and always responsive. And that's amazing. I mean, if you think back to you know, the, the careful planning and pain of most of the interactions um, that have been necessary in the past, this is amazing. Uh, and we talked about the next step being this sort of participation. So the next sort of level of sophistication is really being able to structure the mobile experience so that it is possible. Um, and it's amazing how many people are willing to volunteer time if you provide that means of doing so without a lot of hassle with a lot of focus on a particular thing. You know, report a problem, um, provide back data. You know, essentially, vote with your mobile is another interesting one because, as we mentioned before, there are means of both automatically and sort of involuntarily uh, participating. Uh, you look at a Twitter map and you say, well, you know, I didn't really mean for my government to make decisions about um, what to do next by looking at a map with the density of hashtags uh, of topics of interest to them, but you know, in some way, you are voting for or against uh, government initiatives and activity just by using your phone. Um, that's a scary thought. Uh, and the other essential part of this is that you're working, that focus has to do with particular places. So. It's a way of organizing that information. It's much less overwhelming. Uh, it's a very immediate connection between the information that a government works with and the activities that they have and things on the ground. So uh, that PGOV, that sense that you know, my connection to government activity is very well grounded in particular activities in particular places is an incredibly powerful one. Uh, both for demonstrating the value of government and also seeing where its value is less than realized. Uh, and so that connection of, you know, what is the government doing for me right here and now, or what am I doing for the government, uh, is a very real thing. And then finally, I think the enablement, the empowerment that this gives to people starts to open up the idea of, you know, who's on top? Uh, you know, is it really the government and its citizens? Or is it like when I go to Facebook and it says, you know, like City of Newton? Well, it's just another friend. You know, I team up with them when there's stuff to do, and I uh, don't team up with them when there isn't stuff to do. Uh, and that, I have to say, is a relationship which is powered by this data infrastructure, by the, the roads that are being built so that we can travel them and pick our companions as we go. It's the open data that leads to the boundaries between government, non-government, so all those overlaps we saw before. That's really, the open data is what's making that possible. So that's data which is allowed to be used and data which is provided in such a way that it can be used. We talk about, well, which app should 
the state developed next. And really, the more powerful way of looking at this is how do we let somebody who really is clever, or how do we let the next 10,000 people who are clever make the next app, just by providing them the means to do that. So there are different stages here. Uh, there is this, we have to have the infrastructure. We have to have the data. We have to have that digital representation of the domain that the government's concerned with to start working with. Then we need to connect that to the information and really open up that information from every aspect, every entity, every agency of government and keep that flowing, not just, you know, here's a CD and we'll, uh, we'll uh, update it next year if we have the money. But it's that open flow of information that starts to enable that creativity, those different paradigms. Uh, this is something that is quite difficult, both for people and for governments to do, is to say we're actually going to interact. We're actually going to um, collaborate, and we're going to collaborate at the speed that the technology enables us to, not at one that we pick um, by some chance of tradition 20 years ago. Uh, I think those then end up combining inevitably to consider a sense of place being the, the nexus of that interaction. That, you know, I don't interact with <clears throat> the state of Massachusetts much when I'm in Europe, but I would like to interact with the government of France. Um, the idea of government has the possibility of being connected not in a, you know, well, of course it's just somewhere, but in a much uh, more nuanced sense of geography, of place. And then what that means is that that sense of society, that sense of uh, civic uh, interaction and responsibility becomes what we want and need to do in those places rather than, you know, why am I paying income tax over there? Uh, and uh, so I think that starts to really change, transform the way that, that government both works and that it relates to citizens, that it even defines what a citizen is. So here are some of the aspects of this, uh, the data aspects. The cloud computing is what enables really that analytics in my hand. Um, so that's something that is new. Uh, coming up with the means of regulating and, and coming up with those collaborative workflows, breaking through in many cases customs and traditions, and then figuring out how this crowdsourcing, this social media, these aspects that seem to go completely around government functions and responsibilities actually become part of it, or the other way around, that government becomes part of the society. So, Just a couple other things I'm going to cover real quickly and then I think we'll leave time for questions. Uh, there is this possibility of immense amounts of information from people, both voluntarily, involuntarily, automatically, and uh, that has both Side. So we have the possibility of leveraging, you know, a huge scale of information gathering. An open street map is a wonderful example of this. Uh, the map down at the bottom is, is not lights, but actually tweets expressed as one of these nighttime maps. Uh, so that level of information is amazing. Uh, and Increasingly, there's citizen involvement in science. So this is very deliberate information collecting, you know, detecting um, pests. Uh, I was just hearing from uh, Paul Benet about taking pictures of pests uh, and sending them into the agriculture department so that uh, they can be identified in both uh, crop planning and uh, um, pest control can be planned from this information. 
that is structured carefully can be incredibly valuable um, science information. But then we start to get into these sorts of more um, uh, insensible sources of information. And there are many questions here. Really, um, it's necessary to have an open conversation uh, about the benefits and the drawbacks of many of these technologies. So I don't think anybody said, you know, I want Apple to stop having a Wi-Fi database. I'm perfectly happy to sit for five minutes while the GPS um, synchronizes. But they did have questions about, well, but can't you get rid of that as soon as possible? Or I want to know very well where and to whom that information is going. So open conversations are really the um, necessity here. And this goes into all of these questions about privacy that are exacerbated by the location being such a, a personal um, identifier. And so, you know, for most people under 25, there is no such thing as privacy. Um, there's just, you know, like meteors fall from the sky, there's embarrassment that is unavoidable from time to time, but that doesn't stop them from taking pictures and posting them. Uh, and so there's lots of conversations which really should be happening about uh, what can be done to get both the benefits and minimize the um, hazards of the privacy issues. Finally, um, what's next? And so we, we all have, uh, you know, ways that we've used web applications and maybe smartphones and maybe even smart watches and smart vehicles to uh, combine location with information. Uh, most of them, though, still require skills with reading a map. And so I think everybody should have great skills with reading maps, but once you get past a street map and push pins, things really start to drop off. And part of mobile user experience is really that maps can be pretty hard to work with. Uh, the, the next step really beyond this is to take what we're really looking at and add data to that. And so there's a lot of efforts uh, in technology that's being developed right now. Everybody I think has probably heard of Google Glasses, but this, some of this work was done in the 90s and the 80s. People who had just the same vision but just did not have the technology that we're um, developing here. So there are some amazing possibilities and, and certainly uh, the potential for very large social disturbances to, uh, to make use of this. But it's coming along and, and as with privacy, it's, it's how, we, how we manage and engage with this technology, not whether it's going to appear or not. So to make a summary, uh, I've tried to pull up uh, some aspects of the way that place and with information, including place and location, interacts with other trends, particularly in government, and really enables this evolution which is going on right now. You know, it's, we're, we have the fortune of not having to decide, shall we have uh, you know, mobile GIS apps. It's just a question of where they're going and how is government and how are people going to be changed by it. Uh, we have to still remember, though, it seems to remove the need for some government activities that it's the street, it's the air traffic controller, it's the open spatial data infrastructure that's making this all possible. The range of functions is growing like crazy, but you know we looked at some of the government responsibilities, areas of action, and there's more to be done. So uh, things are only going to increase. Uh, a lot of that has to do with both buckling down and figuring out how people can really work with mobile GIS technology and with really opening the door to the creativity and innovation that is out there. 
by providing those stepping stones. And then uh, I, this is my sort of future seeing is that I think this is going to start to really change the way that people relate to government and vice versa. So it's going to be much more of a real time, you know, who is the community, who is the, the you know, the polis, the, the body of people for this governmental activity at this time in this place. So, there are things that we'll worry about, um, but I'll, I'll be optimistic and say these are good things to worry about. So, the, the possibilities for, you know, a better society, possibilities for, you know, greater prosperity and uh, wisdom, I think, are there, um, just with a little care. So, thank you.